So Sinead, on your website, you say that your dream job should be an extension of your life and who you are, which I think is a really good definition, Uh, especially nowadays, people don't really want to split uh, their work self from who they really are, their personal self. And you have such an interesting background. How did you find yourself becoming, quote, the model who talks tech? Yes, I think, um, well, for, for reassurance, I didn't grow up with that plan at all. I did kind of just grow into myself in many ways. But um, it starts back, I guess, in, in academia. I was always very focused on school. I studied business, finance, chemistry, all sorts of nerdy things. Uh, and then the more I sought after careers that I thought I wanted, um, the end all being kind of management consulting, the further I felt for myself. And I couldn't explain why. Uh, And I think for a lot of people, we look at our life as a hierarchy and careers as linear. And so I would assume maybe if I'm just higher up, um, maybe if I just can manage more people, I have more autonomy. But I think, you know, you'll never feel, it will never feel right in a lane you're not passionate about. Uh, And I was really confronted with that. Uh, when I landed what I thought was my dream job, simultaneously while I was doing my MBA, I was scouted by a modeling agency. Uh, and that was not at all on my path whatsoever. But I did see it as maybe a window to a different life. Uh, I knew what I had built for some reason in this academic corporate world wasn't me. And I didn't know what else it was uh, or wh- where else I was supposed to be. But I just knew it was not that in those rooms, uh, solving those types of problems. So I quit. Uh, moved to New York City, started modeling. And it was once I stepped into the world of the arts and and creative industries that I realized all of the nerdy future of work stuff that I was talking about in my own world, other people are just as interested. They just weren't invited to the conversations about their own futures. So then I kind of saw that opportunity to bridge those worlds because it's not like I left the corporate world uninterested in the material. It just that those weren't the rooms I wanted to be solving problems in. I was very interested in AI, very interested in what the future is going to look like, but I wanted to approach it a different way. And and so modeling technology, those worlds ended up merging. Um, and I realized that I you don't need to edit yourself uh, to exist in a career. And if you do, you're probably in the wrong room. What were you feeling that let you know that you weren't in alignment with what you were supposed to be doing? What were the symptoms that were coming up? A lot of anxiety. Mm. And it was interesting, like the more secured I got towards that, what I thought was the dream job, the greater the anxiety, the greater the lack of sleep. Uh, It was all I could think about. And I was getting quite clear not voices in my head, but knowing I'm in the wrong life. And I remember saying that to p- my close friends and people around me, I feel like I'm in the wrong life, and but I don't know what else I'm supposed to do. Uh, but it, the signs became very physical for me. I, I got more and more anxiety. I landed the internship, felt really scared about that, landed the full-time offer, felt even more anxious. Uh, and that was when it was like something really isn't right. Uh, and it felt quite existential and it couldn't be ignored. And it was like my body was like, we're not going to let you sleep until you figure out this isn't who you're supposed to be. I just heard Sarah Blakely, who started Spanx, say that in a TikTok video that she kept saying she was selling medical devices or something. And she kept saying, I, I'm in the wrong life. I'm in the wrong life. Um, so that must be a common feeling. hmm. You get to the modeling world, which is very different. Uh, And it's still very different from AI and tech. It sounds to me like you stepped in and found it a very joyous place, um, which is actually a little confounding to me because a lot of the people I've had on Pretty Smart who have modeled in the past actually have a lot of trauma from it. Um, Tell me about your experience. Yes. So there's definitely, it, it was very interesting to walk into a room and introduce myself as a consultant. And then a day later, introduce myself as a model and see these stereotypes. Uh, and I have stories for days about the way people responded to me, the way they started to explain things about the world, assuming I didn't understand things. Um, and so that was very real. I think going into it, though, as someone who saw modeling as, a, as an escape and a bridge to something else. I think the pressure was probably different than somebody who maybe knew that that's that's what they wanted to be and and were kind of putting all of their eggs in that basket. Um, So for me, it was a little bit different. And it also forced me to confront my identity as a mixed race woman, something that I never confronted growing up. So my relationship, I think, with modeling was different in that sense. I do, however, especially building more friendships and things with models um, and being 
kind of more exposed to things like castings and people's homes and all of the things that have brought up real problems and challenges and ethical issues and modeling. I've seen some of that um, and been very aware of that uh, and very vocal about that. But I think it was slightly different how I stepped into modeling and was kind of on the edge uh, of the industry in a way. It forced you to confront your identity as a mixed race woman. Yeah, it was the first time in my life where my resume was about how I looked. Right. And I couldn't edit that or or minimize that because I found growing up, um, I love the town that I grew up in. I'm here right now. I always I come back here at any time that I can. But growing up, I there weren't a lot of people that looked like my sisters and I. We were probably one of the only mixed people around. And so for us, uh, that was challenging. And I minimized my identity a lot to kind of fit in. So my hair was always straightened or pulled back. I never wore it curly. Uh, and that incre- it was the same going to university, the same doing my MBA. Um, it was always minimize the thing that made you different. Uh, and then as you step into a world as a model, you, it is just who you are and how you look. Uh, and for me, that was like, it was it became very freeing um, in some ways. So you study the future for a living. And mm-hmm. most people I know are very anxious about looking ahead, especially now because um I'd, I'd consider us going through a technological revolution. Tell me why you're fascinated by the future. Yes. And I know for some people, it gives them a lot of anxiety. And I guess it depends on what you're hearing about the future. But I find it, if you know the different ways things could evolve, because there isn't one future, there's many that we could end up in. I find it kind of empowering to be able to see the data that could align with the future that we would want to be a part of. Uh, So for me, that is really exciting and motivating and inspiring, but also the kind of, I guess, and it's still kind of in my consulting days, connecting data points and having light bulb moments of, oh, this is where we could be headed. And the feeling and excitement of those moments is something that I look forward to every single day. Uh, I spend a lot of my days buried in data white papers and and connecting dots and and data points. And those light bulb moments are just fascinating. I was just at the Collision Conference in Toronto, which is a tech conference. And I was asking everybody about AI and there were a ton of chief technology officers and developers there. And most people were talking about chat GPT because that's what's right in front of us now. I love it. Um, But AI is so much more than just chat GPT. So can you explain how we should be thinking about AI beyond the scope of just chat GPT? Yes. So the way to kind of think about AI is more more like our smartphones or our computers. It's going to be the base layer that everything gets built on top of uh, and is powered by. So if you open up a Word document, expect an AI system in there helping about to help you write. Um, If you're about to search something on the internet, expect to have uh, an AI agent that will kind of, you'll talk with and kind of coach you uh, and support you on whatever it is that you're trying to discover on the internet. So everything that we do going forward will be powered by artificial intelligence, um, which is something that I think is still just wild for people to think about. It is because we grew up during a time where it was only part of film. Um, But I think on a very base level for anybody who's not as familiar with it, I learned just a few weeks ago that I didn't know this, but AI, like all the filters that we use on Instagram and TikTok, that's AI. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what it helps for people to know that you interact with very advanced AI systems every single day. If you use Google Maps, I cannot get down the street without consulting an AI system. I'm lost all the time. Um, If you use a streaming platform, if you use social media, you're always interacting with AI. And so these systems aren't as overwhelming as we think. And we hear kind of crazy things on the news, but for people to recognize that you actually already interact with AI and why it's actually all going so viral is because it's so easy to use. So non-tech people, it's irrelevant. We can all just text with these systems or co-create with them the same way we text friends in group chats. And that's why it's all so transformational. I love that you use the word co-create. I think about that in relationships so often. And now we do have a relationship with technology. When I was at this conference, I was sort of taken by how excited everybody was by AI. And that was such a different sentiment than what I'd been reading about. There's a ton of fear around AI. 
what evidence is, is there that AI could actually be really good for humanity? I mean, if you look statistically, the more we've been empowered by information uh, and the more intelligent people we have trying to solve problems, uh, the better we've been largely as a society. Uh, and that's what AI is. In many, in many ways, it's a microscope to data and a system that can look at data the way humans don't. Uh, and I think that that's really exciting. For example, if you have looked at some of the AI, like ChatGPT or the AI image generators, um, there are researchers now that are taking those same systems and applying them to biology. And they're like, wait, instead of just designing an image of something for somebody's blog, could you design maybe a new medication that resembles how you could treat this? This person has you know this type of a disease. This is what it looks like. Could you design something the way you design a blog post? And we're applying these same systems to those types of problems. And to me, that's an absolute game changer and, and you know, kind of customized education, all sorts of things. So the data in that element is, or in that way is really exciting. Elon Musk is starting a new AI company. And just six months ago, he was one of the most outspoken people um, talking about wanting to slow AI and actually um, he, he, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think he started a petition for all of these tech entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley to sign to slow the design of AI. He clearly jumped on the bandwagon. Um, I heard that what can be helpful right now is listening to people who have a really clear vision of where this technology is going. Who do you think we should be listening to? That's a really, really great question. Um, you have amazing voices in technology, such, such as Dr. Timnit Gerbru, who used to work at Google, uh, Dr. Joy Bulamwini, um, who's posted some incredible papers about things like facial recognition technology. Uh, you have research scientists like, like Gary Marcus uh, mm -hmm. that are calling some more academic attention, um, futurists like Amy Webb. I think you know the list, the list really goes on. I think that there's also the CEO of The Atlantic, um, Nick Thompson, uh, he's great. So there's a lot of different voices that have many different perspectives. And I think the doom and gloom, it's something that I worry about with AI, because one, I think everybody has the right to be informed about their own future. But when it's very all very scary and all doom and gloom, people unsubscribe. And that's actually where we get led astray, because then you have just a few select voices deciding on the future for everybody. Uh, and so that's why I do think it is so important that we have balanced views. And it's not just to be blindly optimistic. Like I'm not a pessimist or an optimist, I'm a futurist. Um, but it's not just to say, you know, who cares about all the risks? It's going to be phenomenal. Like that doesn't end up well either. But I think when you just have nothing but doom and gloom in media narratives, people unsubscribe. Uh, and then the real problems kind of brew that nobody catches. I actually see that so much in democracy. Um, I think a lot of people have hit the unsubscribe button and it's a verb, you know, we have to be active with it. So I agree with you. And that's part of that co-creation you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you think we should be looking out for? Any um, flags that you think should be raised? Yeah, I think we do need more insight and interrogation into the ways we already interact with AI. Um, I mean, there are, of course, the longer term risks with these systems, but I'm very concerned why somebody was or wasn't shown a job posting um, and what elements uh, or categories or demographic factors played into that decision. Um, if you work at a company and your HR team probably uses AI to select resumes, um, that's something that I think that we need to be paying attention to. Thinking twice when you're given a mortgage rate or a credit card, uh, why your rate is a certain way uh, and understanding how AI made that decision. Those are the things that I think the everyday things that actually do have a quite a substantial impact on our life and our quality of life. Um, and then I would also say, you know, social media, I very much believe social media is kind of the most dangerous technology out of all of them. Um, and so that's one on a micro level to try to have a balanced relationship with, but at a macro level, a societal level, we've got to sort some things out with, with social media. I have a ton of questions for you about social, but I want to table that for a second. When you're talking about mortgage rates and um, who's using AI, does that go back to who is designing AI, um, the developers? For instance, Elon Musk's new company is, he staffed all men thus far. Perfect. Awesome. Right. I was like, that tracks. Um, and I'm not, a, I'm not like a hater, but it just... Um, 
there's a great book called The Difference. And the author talks about how diversity is actually so uh, foundational to success and not just in a financial way, but like, for instance, um, smallpox was um, cured by a milk farmer. And so um, they recognized something on the farm that other people didn't. And that's diversity and IQ, you know? And so Mm -hmm. how does that work? How do you fix the pipeline. That seems tough. Yeah. Yeah. I think when it comes to AI, there's kind of two big categories that impact outcomes. So one is the data that the AI systems are trained on. Uh, And data usually comes from the past. And the past is usually something we're not trying to repeat as a society. So you really need to take a critical lens to that data um, to understand who may have been subject to some biases, um, to some discrimination that are present in these data sets. And why the people building these AI systems matter is because if you don't have diverse voices in that room, you're not going to have people who even know to look out for certain things in data anyways. Uh, And it can even be something as small as deciding to include postal codes in mortgage rates because there are certain neighborhoods of communities that may have been um, predominantly discriminated against that's in that data set. But if you think, oh, it's fine, it's just postal code as a data marker, that's actually could be very problematic when you don't have diversity. And it's like, as you said, it's not just diversity and and more typical demographics, but in thought and ideas, uh, you'll probably miss things completely. And in jobs entirely, like in in tech rooms, especially AI, because a lot of the problems we're trying to solve with AI are actually some of them philosophical in nature. So you do need ethicists, philosophers, historians, all to make this kind of big socio-technical technology work properly. So two things on that. The first is uh, autocorrect. Is that AI? Yes. But I've also noticed that my friends that have ethnically diverse names, it autocorrects them for me. And I was thinking to myself the other day, that's an issue in who is developing this technology. It doesn't autocorrect the name Claire. No, 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 it's definitely not. It's not autocorrecting Anne. Um, and it's the same with voice recognition. So a lot of voice recognition systems don't recognize people with accents. And there was actually a problem um, in immigration. And maybe they've solved it now, but I know in immigrating to the States, some people that had different accents, the AI translators weren't, weren't understanding what they said. Um, and that's just one of the many, many ways facial recognition, when a lot of the systems were originally tested on white males, they would flag people that looked like me um, because I just wasn't really considered in that data set. Uh, So it it is really significant in all of the subtle ways. Uh, Or Google Translate, um, there were past examples where when it would translate something, certain languages that have um, feminine and and male or masculine um, terms, it would always translate things that were more stereotypically associated with males. It would automatically send those to the masculine, um, in other words, to the feminine or just things like for a long time, if you Googled CEO, the only female CEO that would show up on Google was Barbie. Um, and that was what the AI, that's all we really got. That has since been changed. But yes, all of those historical biases are baked into this, the data and into these systems. I'm fascinated by the future of work with, with AI. Um, I have a friend who works in virtual reality. And he was telling me that he's most interested in use cases for the elderly. Uh, So for instance, like, you know, you can put a headset on, like maybe your grandmother who lives in uh, a home in a totally different state and she can watch a concert or feel more connected because there's so much isolation as you get older. In terms of AI and the future of work, Are there um, positives that you see? Because I just keep hearing, quote, AI is going to take all of our jobs and leave an entire sect of people unemployed, which will ultimately lead them to be disenfranchised. And we know how the cycle goes. Oh, God. Yeah, I think um, with AI, there will, of course, be transformation uh, and things will change. But if you look at the creator economy, I mean, how many people exist as creators, as podcasters, as YouTubers, that did not exist as a sector prior to smartphones and the internet. So there are jobs and industries that we can't even imagine. And the way that it's actually empowered a lot of, of people who have stepped into the creator economy and have an entirely different life path uh, than previously just did not exist. 
So the same can be said with AI. It's hard to even imagine the ways it's going to transform our world um, that just simply do not exist today. I agree with you, right? Like with any new industry comes a whole new sect of jobs, but those are usually young people who have not been trained yet, right? And so they're jumping into something new. How about the people who work in factory lines who are 45 or 50, people who work in coal mining, et cetera, who are going to find it probably very difficult to take a course and learn how to code? I don't know if that's even realistic. Yeah. So there's a few things there. Um, So who automation impacts? And actually, historically, unfortunately, a lot of the more physical labor jobs, so whether you're in a plant, those have been already quite severely automated. If you look at a car factory today versus 60 years ago, it's predominantly machines. Um, going forward, the more fine fine granular things like being, like being an electrician or a plumber, dexterity, that's actually a lot harder to automate. So yes, there is, it's going to be challenging If we do have robots and AI that continue to change and transform things like um, more physical jobs, it's actually much more knowledge workers that are going to be impacted by this next wave of AI. When you say knowledge workers, who do you mean? If you do work on a computer, so you use digital technologies and software. So maybe you're an attorney, maybe you do taxes, maybe you're a marketer or a financial analyst. Um, all of those jobs will be impacted by artificial intelligence in some way. They already have an AI news anchor in Japan. (laughs) Yeah. And those kind of more novel ways um, will happen more. Like even, yes, in in entertainment, we'll start to see more digital twins. Uh, We'll start to see celebrities send out a digital twin to film a commercial versus actually go and do that. Um, So we'll see automation in that type of way. So does that mean like people will get paid more? Like Samuel L. Jackson sends his twin and it's 50 grand. But if he comes himself, it's 100 grand. It depends because is it more work if he comes in person? So I feel like, wow, it's actually easier, not only just for Samuel L. Jackson, but for the team to just render him into an ad than physically bring him on set. Um, Yeah, it, it could be easier to do a bunch bunch of different takes. You just tell the AI more emotive, less emotive. Um, And you could actually have Samuel see his own performance as an AI and adjust it himself. So yeah, in terms of the compensation and how things get valued going forward, um, that will be also something that's kind of up in the air. But I do think celebrities, instead of leaving a movie set to go shoot a toothpaste commercial, you would just have your AI do that. Or if you shoot a scene and instead of having to bring everybody back to make the edit because somebody tripped and it looked terrible in post-production, you just use their digital twin. Uh, There's of course a whole other world of Hollywood that things are going to change. And I've started to post, I did something today about the SAG after union. um, Hollywood is going to get quite transformed, um, but digital twins, yes, it's just kind of scratching the surface. So that's a perfect segue. You have said that we are going to see a creative boom. What do you mean? Yes. So the same way the internet led to this entire world of the creator economy, what happens when people now have access to creative intelligence? Um, And so a way, a a professor of mine, I think Goldfarb likes to describe it as there's a lot of creative people, but not everybody can draw. And so what happens when you have a system that can do some of that skill and now your imagination is what you had, but you didn't have the ability to articulate that. Now you have a system that's kind of like that broker. How many more creative ideas and things that will actually get brought to life, Uh, whether that's in filmmaking, people that have amazing ideas, but maybe they're not good at script writing. They have maybe a teammate that can help them ideate. Um, or a, a creator that's their film is never going to be seen by a big studio, but they can use AI to bring some of it to life themselves. Uh, all of the different ways that we can't even really picture yet uh, that I think could be really exciting. Kind of like the iPhone, right? Like eventually a whole film was was made just on the iPhone. We would have never thought about that. Yeah. And I think the iPhone, and even then I don't even, I think AI will be more disruptive than the iPhone. I think how the iPhone allowed everybody to suddenly present themselves and we could go down the rabbit hole of why social media is crazy, but how the iPhone allowed everybody to pre- present themselves to the world uh, or smartphones allowed this new world where it's me for everyone to see. Uh, it, it's a fundamental paradigm shift. 
uh, AI will have those types of transformations that we can't even imagine. I mean, if you had a team of 15 employees, how would that change what you do? And when you think about that question, you realize, hmm, the things I would maybe build or be able to, to create, it's it's just a different ballpark. It's just a different scale. There's that meme about like, we all have the same amount of hours as Beyonce. Um, but I feel like, but do we though? I think we need to get some physics professors in on that because she has access to some space time reality that we just don't. There's, I think she's just, yeah, there's something on a quantum level. Well, it's that she has a whole team, right? Like now everybody's going to have access to a team, which is kind of exciting. Yeah, it, it really changes the game. I think if you ask yourself, if you had 15 employees, what would you do differently? And then it's like, oh, wait, you will. Does it also have to do with time or twin to something? Or if I now have an assistant that I don't have to pay to do a ton of administrative work, it frees up my time to be more creative. Totally. The types of problems that you have to, you get to focus on and put your energy towards. Uh, if you can have an AI dealing with more of the repetitive things or the non-critical thinking parts of whatever it is that you work on, that's really helpful. Uh, if you think of just how helpful has email been in our world? And you can't even, it's come, It's very challenging to even put a measurement and quantify how transformation it is, transformational it is, that we don't have to package up a letter or fax something. So when you think about it, if you had an assistant in every kind of lane, how game-changing that would be, it becomes immeasurable. And again, it's hard for us to imagine because we don't have it yet, uh, but then it eventually becomes email where you're like, I don't even, I can't even talk about what email did to my life because there's just no other way I could have existed. So according to the McKinsey Global Institute, by 2030, which is in seven years, more than 800 million jobs will be replaced by technology. How do you think this is going to change work in the immediate future for people? Yes. So I think um, we will start to see the automation of tasks within jobs. So it's very challenging, regardless of what job you do, you're a um, marketing analyst, you are a financial stock, whatever it is, it's hard to have an AI system that can just come and do all of those tasks. That would be a different level of AI that people debate. Do we have it? Do we not? Will we ever have it? That's different. What you're likely to see is certain tasks within your job get automated. And so if, say, 20% of your job can be done by AI, and now you have 80% less and maybe or set to do, or maybe 70%. We will likely see companies move away from hiring people full time. Because if you don't, if you know AI is going to disrupt their role by the end of the year, it's going to look different. You're much less likely to hire for a full-time role. You're much more likely to do more contract-based. So it means most of us will end up in the gig economy. And we see gig economy as like food delivery, but it will be lawyers everybody will be in the gig economy. And so maybe you work for three or four different companies doing the 60% of your job that required just your critical thinking skills and your strategic management skills. Um, and all of the rest is automated to AI. So it fundamentally changes the nature of work and what we consider work. That is fascinating because it's going to change healthcare. It's, that's going to be such a domino effect. Of and I'm quite vocal about we need to understand what do we need to, to decouple from our current systems that we're setting up you know, for people to fail in the future. If you attach healthcare to somebody's job and we know work is going to look very different, um, that's an obvious thing that we need to zoom into. What else do you think we need to decouple? I think uh, identity from work is a big one. No, and work is my identity, Shanae. <laughs> I just only want to be work. I don't want to be anything else but work. Just please associate with every, whatever you see on my LinkedIn, yes. I only want to be that. So wait, why do you see identity? That's funny. I think, um, you know, technology has some something to do with that in a world where the workforce is going to continue to be disruptive or disrupted and people start to have more transitions in their career. We already know that from our parents' generation, that idea that you do one thing forever, that's changed. And we've already adapted to that. And we kind of look back at generations where people worked for the same company for 25 years. We're like, wow, now it's you know three years, five years. And, uh, and that transition, it's only going to, to pick up. Uh, so kids in school today will likely hold 17 jobs across five different industries. So you, you can't be just one thing. Uh, so we have to move away from the idea that you are your job because your job is going to be something that always changes as are the skills you're going to need to bring to the workforce. And the workforce is just going to look entirely different. If 
say by 2028, most people are in the gig economy and you're a, a marketer and you work for five different companies doing all sorts of different things, you're technically actually an entrepreneur because you yourself are the company. Right. So, so much of how we think about work is going to change. Another thing is a lot of the jobs that exist today will be changed if not automated. So you could be setting people up for failure by saying, you know, I want to be this one job and that one job might not even exist anymore yeah. uh, or look different. And I think it also gives us a lot of anxiety, this idea when you couple your job to your identity, your worth becomes measurable in terms of something external to you. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that that's a way to live peacefully or joyously. I don't think anything positive comes from that, um, from your identity being something that other people can value and it's compensated. Your worth isn't, it shouldn't be tied to that. And so I think we need to separate from that. You actually wrote for Vogue about how modeling even needs to prepare for AI's prevalence. And so what I mean by that is if even something like modeling or, or in the entertainment world or modeling world, if we see less people and now it's kind of AI automation in that sense. I mean, if you look at social media and in, in many ways, are we less human because we do filter and edit ourselves so much uh, to the point where it's kind of changed the global psyche as to what we try to strive to be and how we present ourselves. And I don't think that that's a good thing. Um, and so in a world where maybe we automate something like fashion modeling, the standards become even more unachievable. And I don't think that that's a good direction to go in. But there's also a future where, so maybe things like fashion modeling becomes more automated, but it also becomes more personal. So you don't try to see how clothes look like look on other people. The AI model you see is you. Uh, and that's who's in the close. And so there are those different versions of what could happen. And so when we look at the future, it's so important that we break free from the frameworks of the present because those limits don't have to evolve with us. And so maybe there is a world where that is what happens for modeling. And we actually just a couple the idea from, you know, that people, other people need to represent what we should look like in clothes. No, maybe you should just be your own champion and see how things look on you automatically. And so that's also a world that could happen. So what are your predictions with social media? Because this is fascinating to hear. Um, you think it's going to get way more personal? I think in the future, we are going to look at social media the way we look at cigarettes, the level of harm, uh, the ability to scientifically realize that there was measurable harm done um, I think it's going to be something that a massive light bulb goes off. And I think it already is. And we already have this sense that something isn't right. The environment doesn't feel good. We know it's been linked, especially for teen girls, depression. And I think once all of the data comes back, we're going to really view this last decade as the dopamine generation, the way we view our parents' decade as the nicotine generation. And so I think we're going to really transform social media and put limits and guardrails. And that's actually something that I look forward to. It is so unfortunate that we all have to be in this massive group chat, social experiment that necess isn't necessarily going well. But I do look forward to seeing how we're going to evolve through it and what's to come. Uh, and so we are starting to realize that it isn't necessarily healthy to have a bunch of people rate how you look. Um, or have filters that can create the Eurocentric version of you. And that's what we subscribe to. Uh, or just have the dopamine slot machines designing things that we interact with every day and with similar frameworks isn't healthy. So I think we're going to grow. We're in the growing pains of social media, but I think we'll break free from it. And I think that that will hopefully be amazing. I hope so too. I think, uh, to kind of put it in very simple terms, our touch screens have made us lose touch. Mm -hmm. We're talking about body image. Um, and I think you have such an interesting perspective, having been a model and now being a futurist. How do you think history is going to reflect back on the Kardashians? And maybe they're almost um, like representation of what those what the values are. I don't know if history will look back on the Kardashians or look back on society and who we chose to seek influence from. When it comes to the Kardashians, they're people that were very skilled at, at leveraging the tools of the moment 
um, and becoming the people of, of the moment. And that's maybe more of a question. If we think as a society, that's not the best version of us. Mm -hmm. I think we also need to look back on ourselves. Why is that who we seek influence from time and time again? So that's kind of how I think I would view that. I think that's a great way of putting it. What type of regulation do you think is likely? Because I was reading that the White House put forth an AI Bill of Rights, which is basically a blueprint for the expansion. But where do you think the safeguards are going to come in? I think we will hopefully move towards a future where the way we have the FDA and we make sure products are safe before a bunch of people use them or ingest them or interact with them. Um, I think we'll hopefully have systems like that. Uh, where we have auditors, we audit our taxes, which is so annoying for everybody, but things that are making life or death decisions for people. If you go to jail and spend more years or less years, we just kind of just throw our hands up and, and leave it to an algorithm. So I think we'll have more regulations there. Um, we'll have auditing. Maybe we might even see some companies that have really powerful AI systems have to get certain amount of approval. And then I also think we'll hopefully arrive at a time where we or get to a point where we see where AI shouldn't also play a role. Like I think just because technology can exist and it can make things more efficient, it doesn't always mean that it's the right solution uh, or that everything needs to be digitized or automated. Uh, and I hope in the future we recognize there are certain bases that we want to maintain as uniquely human. Uh, and hopefully that becomes a part of our, our infrastructure. I've heard people talk about an ethics committee for social media. Um, it sounds like it would kind of work for AI as well. I think it's hard because it's global. So it's not just like we're appointing a national ethics committee to discuss issues of technological advancement. Um, is that something that you think is viable? Yeah, I think we should have national committees. We'll have international committees. Hopefully we have that uh, in many ways, like the United Nations is a, a team of member states that kind of approach different challenges, global challenges as, as a team, as a group. Uh, and I think we'll need that as well. Some people call it, you know, like a CERN for AI uh, or different governing committees. And I think that that's quite essential because yes, AI doesn't stop at the border. Mm -hmm. uh, we know technology is largely borderless, and that's in some ways what makes it so great, but it also can make a certain country's approach to AI irrelevant if not everybody sees it the same way. So I think we do need to get on the same page with AI. So in line with ethics, there's this theory that AI is learning off of human data so that it will have all of the biases that human beings have. And I was listening to this hard fork podcast about it. And they were saying that the fear is that it will not only replicate those biases, but bury them in a way that it will make it hard for humans to find them. That was sort of mind blowing to me. Um, I think the ethics are actually at the, at the root of things. The ethics are what is really terrifying to people. Are you a proponent for all of us being in the conversation of how this tech will be used? Like what power? will I as an individual have? Mm -hmm. I think technology and AI needs to be a language that everybody is fluent in uh, and everybody understands how AI makes decisions about them when they're interacting with an AI system. And I don't think we should just allow tech to be something that developed in a box by a few people who just get to decide how our future is getting coded. I don't think that that is how things are going to end up well. Uh, so I do think tech education, and that's why it is so important that it starts in school. I mean, ChatGPT, we saw a lot of schools try to quickly ban it. And I think that that's actually very disappointing. ChatGPT, that's going to be a part of students' future. And we also want them to learn how to use it safely. And when you ban AI, you ban an opportunity for people to learn and how to learn and, and to understand. To speak to AI in particular not only automating biases, but making it more challenging to discover what those biases are. Uh, yes, that's two very real challenges. Uh, one being the black box. We don't actually understand how AI makes the decisions that it does. So it takes all of this data, and then we un don't understand how it weights all of the different data. It just gives us an output. So we know what we sent in. We don't know what it's doing, but it comes out with a, yes, this person should or shouldn't be granted a mortgage, and we don't know why. Um, and that's where it just becomes easy to just kind of put your hands up and say, well, it's probably right. It's AI. It has all of these statistical mathematical tools. So it probably has the right answer uh, when that might not be true at all. Um, and yes, AI doesn't just 
automate biases, it can amplify them, unfortunately. What unsettles you the most about this tech? I think we all feel very overwhelmed Mm -hmm. by this moment. And what makes me the most fearful is that we become so overwhelmed by it and we can't agree on what future we want with it that we end up not actually doing anything. So we all know we want to regulate AI. We all know there needs to be safeguards. We all know we want an ethical lens to AI. But because it's challenging as to how we do that, that we just end up never agreeing and we don't actually end up doing anything. And that's something that I'm quite concerned about. And I hope that that's not what happens. I read Hillary Clinton's last book and uh, she was asked by somebody like what, knowing all the information that you know, she has, she's privy to information a lot of us don't have. What are you most concerned about? And she said regulation around the internet that we're so behind. I'm afraid we will not catch up. There's still no regulation around the internet. We saw with the hearings with Mark Zuckerberg, the questions that politicians were asking, like they had no idea for the most part what they were talking about. If we're so behind on the internet, how are we even going to start with AI? I'm very concerned about that. Yes. So if we look at the internet as the example for how to approach <laughs> regulation and keep people safe, I mean, so you can just hit unsubscribe. Yeah. Uh, because that's nobody's learning anything from that. that. We need to just forget that as that that in itself was a Black Mirror episode. Just people being like, how do you turn on the internet? That's just where we don't need to go. The good thing with AI and the positive, the, the positive of this moment feeling so alarming to people and everyone just suddenly waking up to AI is you do have a lot of people saying, one, we all have the PTSD of the internet and social media and nobody doing anything about it. So we're approaching AI in a very different way. You have p- people, family members talking about AI ethics at dinner. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been on daytime talk shows talking about True. automation and our, our public discourse is now around how do we build a system with AI that we all want to be a part of. And I think that that's fundamentally different than how we approach the internet. We all just kind of woke up and we're like, actually, this is crazy, this internet and social media, and this is nuts and nobody can get along. And what I can, I don't know, have a good relationship with this platform. We all just kind of woke up in this nightmare. But with AI, I think we're still, we're early enough that it's not too late. Mm-hmm. Uh, and people do seem motivated to act. Uh, even if it is a little bit intimidating. If you could share one piece of advice with people around AI, if somebody were to listen to this podcast and leave and do one thing, what would it be? I would say that the absolute best thing you can do about the future is prepare for it. And so it's to do that, you have to lean into it. Uh, You have to learn about it. But then you can also shape it. I think everybody has a role to play in helping us build and walk toward the future we want to be a part of. But to play that role, you do have to lean into it and see what could be possible. Um, But the more voices we have shaping our future, the absolute better it's going to be. I think um, from the tech conference I went to, everybody was just saying, engage with it, play around with it. They were saying that it's not that AI is going to take our jobs. It's people who learn how to use AI that will take jobs. So be the person who learns AI. Totally. And I would say with these systems in particular, if you have a smartphone and if you send emails and if you are able to stream a few things on streaming platforms, you have the skills to work with AI. That's what's made these systems so disruptive, but also so accessible. Uh, If you can do any of that, you're, you're good. You're golden. You can work with these systems. A few rapid fire questions for you. Okay. A way that you've learned to use chat GPT that you can impart on everybody? I use ChatGPT to provide me with perspective on how I could bring an idea to market. So I'll have an idea for like an op-ed and I'll kind of state my idea to to ChatGPT Mm -hmm. and ask it, you know, what do you think? Uh, Or what do you think I'm trying to tell the audience? Wait, how do you word it to ChatGPT? I will word it. uh, This is the idea I have for an op-ed that I think people could find valuable for these reasons. I'm going to write you the opening paragraph or just kind of a synopsis. Uh, And then I send it and I say, what do you think I'm trying to 
communicate to people with this. And that's, when it responds, and sometimes it's it's still just a statistical modeling language model. Sometimes it responds and it's entirely unhelpful. And sometimes when it tells me something, I'm like, wow, I actually didn't think about that. And I do see how that could have been picked up uh, or it's something that I should interrogate more in my writing. So I use it more as on an ideation level mm-hmm. um, than outsourcing a bunch of written material too. What is your most used social media app? It's YouTube. And the reason why is that I, I spend so much time streaming mindset, mindfulness, and guided meditations that if you were to look, if you were to look at my hours spent on my phone, it's insane. Sometimes it's like 14 hours, but it's because I'll go to bed with a bunch of guided meditations. I'll wake up. I constantly have programming, meditative programming around me. So by default, it is you too. So that's actually perfect for my next question, which is what boundaries have you set when it comes to your devices? Intense boundaries. Really? I'm very, very intense about social media and my phone. So I don't check social media past 8 p.m. The only platform I would sometimes make exceptions for is Twitter. Now Twitter has kind of changed, Um, but maybe Twitter is like 8.30, but I don't go on video or image-based social media platforms, TikTok, Instagram, past 8 p.m. ever. So stop checking email, put my phone on airplane mode before I go to bed. Uh, Or if I'm listening to YouTube, I let that run, but there's no checking of anything else. Mm. I do not check social media. So I wake up, I do a guided meditation. I put on music, dance. I go to the coffee shop. I have my mindfulness on. I make a conscious decision every day when I'm going to engage with social media. And sometimes I get home from from the coffee shop. And I'm like, you know what? It's actually not going to be a social media day. I need my full brain. And we all know social media fragments us. We feel like we can't think as clearly. But sometimes social media never gets opened or sometimes my phone stays in a different room. Uh, Or I make a decision, okay, I think I'm ready to check this platform. But every day it's a conversation with myself because social media isn't the default radio frequency that should be in the background of our day. To me, it's a conscious decision. The way you choose to hang out with a friend or make a phone call um, social media, I have that same, does this fit in my day to day? Do I have energy for this? Um, and I guess, so I'm, I'm very intense with my boundaries around my devices and social media. Thank you for sharing that. I personally needed to hear that. You're welcome. Yeah. It took me a while. It wasn't always that way, but it, it's, it's changed the game for me. Yeah. I actually get anxious. Like today I didn't get to wake up and meditate. And then I ended up on my phone earlier and I already felt like kind of mm-hmm. in distress with it. Me too. I feel that way. I, um, took a vacation and I was off my phone for three days and I had never felt better. I was mm-hmm. shocked by Freed. it. Yeah. Freed. What's your hot take? What is your most controversial opinion? Do you think? On a tech hot take that maybe throws people off. I think eventually we will pass down our memories in our wills, the way we pass down homes and inheritance. Oh, I, love I think we will eventually be able to And we already are starting to like the fact that in a hundred years, children of the future will be able to see how their grandparents weighed in on cultural moments. Mm -hmm. Um, All of that is going to be a part of the children of the future, their kind of dictionary of the past. Uh, But I think we'll eventually have the science and the technology to be able to pass down specific moments um, in our family and, and to our children and grandchildren, which I think is going to be wild. That gave me chills. Is there a book that you've read that has changed your life? Sapiens, I think, is is a must for everybody by Yuval Nora Harari. I think that's an absolute game changer. Uh, actually, if I could be reincarnated as somebody, I think it would be Yuval Noah Harari. He is just such a brilliant mind. Uh, so that's been a game changer. I love Educated. Yeah, I thought that one was really good um, and became hard to put down. I mean, a lot of my books are also very tech, nerdy. Um, would be maybe very boring to some people. No, please share. I think it's so interesting to hear the resources that you're learning from. So yeah, I think anything you all know Harari is, is amazing. I think uh, The Exponential Age by Azim Asar is another one that's really interesting. Because if you do feel like we're living in a time where you just can't even keep up, everything is just exponentially fast and, and increasing, yeah. that book kind of takes you through all of the different ways that that's very true. Um, what are another ones? If you like understanding that the global landscape of AI, how countries are competing, um, AI superpowers is one that is, is quite interesting. 
Um, if you're just starting out, how to talk to robots, if you just want to understand what the heck is AI and where do I even begin? So I do uh, a pretty smart question. Okay. Tell me when to stop. Okay, stop. This is an interesting one for you. What is your earliest memory or example of what success looked like and how did it impact you? That's a really great one because I often say the thing I would do differently in life life, if I could go back, is ask myself earlier, what does success look like to you? Because I spent so many years not defining it and outsourcing that to other people's versions of success. I have a strange relationship with that question because I think that that's the thing that I needed to do differently, redefine it for myself. I mean, I think even more recently, as I started to kind of break free from that other world and insert myself uh, as a futurist and in many ways a creative the first talk that I did where I wasn't sure if anybody would show up um, and it wasn't a packed house at all, but how right it all felt mm -hmm. um, and getting that sense of whoever it is you think you're becoming, you're taking the right steps um, and feeling that kind of sense of relief, which was helpful. What is the smartest decision you've ever made? To quit my job. Yeah. As a consultant. <laughs>